Good evening and Merry Christmas. Let us prepare to celebrate this special night as we listen to Amy and Chris as we listen to the prelude. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Tete koto tefano o Auckland Unitarians. Tete koto non manuhiri. No mai, har mai, har mai ki tene fare karakia, ate atua, very kiri himete, ki a koto, tete koto, tete tato, katoa. Merry Christmas to you all, and welcome to our annual Christmas Eve candlelight service in the sunshine. My name is Clay, and I have the privilege of being this congregation's minister. We're delighted you have chosen to share this special service with us, one we have celebrated 116 times since members of this congregation designed the building and helped build it. And now concerning the reason you came tonight. Tonight's service acknowledges the roots of our Unitarian faith by sharing in the Christmas story, but just as importantly, the delights of the Southern Hemisphere's summer solstice. As the Northern half of the planet prepares to celebrate Christmas and the turn of the year, so do we in the Southern seas. But they could not be more different on the surface. Not for us, the bitter cold of the winter solstice, encouraging us to gather around blazing fires and feasts. Not for us, the acceptance of darkness and the lack of light and warmth until the coming of spring gives new hope for abundance to come. No, it's a time for shorts, the beach, barbecues, tending the garden, tramping the bush and relaxing. It reminds us that Christmas is not just a one-day affair, but to be lived out year-long. So if you came to this place expecting a more chilled, she'll be right, tame story, you came to the wrong place. If you came for a story that does not threaten you, you came for a different story than the one we will tell. For even a story about a regular baby is not a tame thing. The story of the baby we celebrate tonight is one that is full of goodness. But goodness that cannot threaten complacency and evil is not much good at all. But if you came because you think that unwed teenage mothers are some of the strongest people in the world, if you came because you think that the kind of people who work a third shift doing stuff you'd rather not do might attract an angel's attention before you would. If you came because you think there are wise men and women to be found among refugees and migrants from far lands and that they might reveal a God you can believe in. If you came to hear a story of tyrants trembling when heaven comes to peasants, if you came because you believe animals are as important as people, and so it is fitting that they were the first witnesses to the birth of transforming love. If you came for a story of reversals that might end up reversing you. If you came for a tale of adventure and bravery where strong and gentle people win and the powerful and violent go down to dust, where the rich lose their money but find their lives, and the poor are raised up like kings. If you came to be reminded that a God you can or cannot believe in loves you too much to leave you unchanged. If you came to follow the light even if it blinds you. If you came for transformation and not safety, then, ah, oh, my friends, you're in the right place. For my opening words, the Northern Hemisphere's winter solstice is associated with the birth of many pagan gods from ancient Babylonia, Rome, Scandinavia, including Mithras, Horus, Hercules, Zeus, and Saul Invictus the unconquered sun. It was also at this time the festival of Saturnalia, honoring Saturn, the god of agriculture. 
It was during the reign of Emperor Constantine in 336 that the first celebration of Christmas on December 25th is recorded. In 350, Pope Julius I made it a, the official date of Christ's birth. There's little doubt he was trying to make it as painless as possible for pagan Romans to convert to Christianity. The new religion went down a bit easier for them knowing that their feasts were not being taken away from them, simply rebranded. Christmas in England became known as the season of irreligious revelry as the tradition of the 12 days of misrule became popular. It was, in all respects, an appropriation of Saturnalia's wild festivities. The Romans knew how to party. Puritans were offended by it, and celebrating it was banned during the time of Oliver Cromwell. After the restoration of the monarchy, people once again started to observe Christmas. But in Puritan North America, it was banned in 1621, and remained illegal for 150 years. In 1842, Charles Dickens visited America. Most of what he encountered disillusioned him, with the exception of meeting Boston Universe Unitarians, in particular Ralph Waldo Emerson and William Ellery Channing. Inspired by Boston Unitarians' understanding of Christmas, he wrote upon his return, a Christmas story without once mentioning Jesus. In A Christmas Carol, Dickens shows it's possible to experience a conversion, not necessarily based on a specific religious experience, but a personal regeneration that leads one to help others. With Scrooge, Scrooge's transformative change of heart, Dickens illustrates that all of us, can be converted from a harsh, complacent, selfish worldview to one of love, hope, and charity. And like Scrooge, can again become part of the human community. For Dickens, that was the true meaning of Christmas. Its popularity led many non-Unitarians to adopt these values. Every year in America, Fox News expresses outrage that there is a war on Christmas. They demand that Christ be put back in Christmas to preserve its Christian roots. This is ironic since it was Christianity that hijacked the holiday in the first place to make it easier to convert those who celebrated the sun's conquering of darkness on December 25th. Nevertheless, it is a wonderful opportunity to share our love with friends and family and commit acts of goodwill for those less fortunate. It is time for children to revel in their innocence and wonder about the world and for adults to find their inner child. Here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, it is a time for us to recognize the Christian roots of our secular society while celebrating the many pagan traditions that Christmas now incorporates. It is also a time to recommit ourselves to peace in a world where that is a rare state of affairs and to show compassion for those who suffer from war, social injustice, and poverty. No matter what our religious background or beliefs, we can also take the opportunity to celebrate, a little belatedly, our summer solstice and the long days of warmth and light that lie ahead, marked by the brilliantly decorated Pohutukawa, our Christmas tree. I now invite Sally Mabel to light the very first of the many Christmas chalices Unitarians will light around the world this holy night. All around the world, the light of honest thought shines, showing people the path to their own authentic faith. All around the world, the warmth of community glows, drawing people in from loneliness and estrangement. All around the world, the flame of 
justice burns, inspire people to acts of faith-filled courage. Here, too, may the light and warmth of this chalice be to us a beacon of truth, generosity, and compassion that we may learn the ways of faith and love. Thank you, Sally. I would now like to invite Kate Todd forward to read a poem entitled Nativity. Hi, for the kids who are here, I just thought I'd say this poem is, teach, is telling us to look inside and to think about whether the birth of the baby in the manger could be something that happens inside us. Okay, so it's not just about the baby Jesus being, Jesus being born in the hay with the, the sheep and the cattle watching. It's about could that birth of the baby Jesus be inside you? Look now, it's happening again. Love like a high spring tide is swelling to fullness and overflowing the banks of our small concerns. And here again is the star that white flame of truth blazing the way through us through a desert of tired words. Once more comes the music, angel song that lifts our hearts and tunes our ears to the harmony of the universe, making us wonder how we could ever have forgotten. And now the magi within us gathers up gifts of gold and myrrh, while the other part of ourselves the impulsive, reckless shepherd runs helter-skelter with arms outstretched to embrace the wonder of it all. We have no words to contain our praise. We ache with awe. We tremble with miracle as once again in the small, rough stable of our lives, Christ is born. David Roy will now read a Christmas poem about an unlikely Christ written by R.A.K. Mason, the New Zealand poet and playwright, who actually premiered one of his plays in this space. On the swag, his body doubled under the pack that sprawls untidily on his old back, the cold, wet deadbeat plods up the track. The cook peers out. Oh, curse that old lag here again with his clumsy swag made of dirty old turnip bag. Bring him in, cook, from the gray level sleet. Put silk on his body, slippers on his feet. Give him fire and bread and meat. Let the fruit be plucked and the cake be iced. The bed be snug and the wine be spiced in the old cove's nightcap. For this is Christ. The following story is about a unique Kiwi Christmas written by renowned New Zealand author Joy Cowley. There is no snow in it, but there is a fish. I would like to invite Rachel McIntosh forward to read The Fish. The Fish by Joy Cowley. All right, I said I'd tell you about the fish. Well, summer was early that year, and there was no going to town on Christmas Eve because of the hay, you see. Mum was driving the tractor, Dad was on the trailer, and us five kids were helping Uncle Pete load. Hard work in the heat, bales like big wheat bicks tied with green twine. We had tough hands, but the string still cut, and there were thistles to be dug out of fingers. 
boy, were we pleased to see Uncle Pete's wife, Auntie Roymata, bouncing across the paddocks on her motorbike. It was a BSA Bantam with a spring clip on the carrier and a box with two flagons of lemon cordial and some sandwiches, and I forget what else. No, not the fish. I'm coming to that. So we all sat in the macro carpa shade, us kids still moaning about town. It was the shopping, you see. We hadn't bought anything for mum and dad. The tree was up in the bay window. We'd made our own decorations, ping pong balls painted with glitter, silver bells from milk bottle tops, crepe paper streamers. But what about the presents? It was all right for our parents. They'd got stuff for us kids weeks before. We'd seen the parcels at the back of the garage. It was them who were going to miss out. I said we should all drive into town when the hay was finished, but mum said we'd be too tired. Forget it, said Dad. Getting the hay in the barn's the best present you could give us. Uncle Pete and Auntie Roy said, yeah, yeah, too right. But they didn't understand how us kids felt. You couldn't put hay under the tree with a card. Merry Christmas, Mum and Dad. They were spot on, though, about us being tired. We didn't get the last bales in until dark, and by then we were just about asleep on our feet. If I remember rightly, I didn't even get in my pyjamas. The fish? No, I haven't forgotten about the fish. We're coming to that. I guess we woke up early. Kids always do, don't they? Our toys were by the tree and they were corker. Mum and Dad had gone around the auction mart, bought second-hand stuff and cleaned it up. I got a tool kit with real tools and a pump-action oil can. The others had a bike, scooter, cricket set, a music box. Mum got some of us to help her pod the peas. My sisters sang, While shepherds watched their socks by night, all seated on the ground, a cake of life boy soap came down, and soap suds splashed around. Mum told them off, but she wasn't really mad. It was when she opened the meat safe that she got upset. No fridge in those days, you see. And with the hot weather, the leg of lamb for Christmas dinner was as high as a kite. It smelled like it had been lying in the paddock for three weeks. Poor mum. She threw the stinking meat out to the dogs and said, That's it! That's it! I give up! Dad put his arm around her. He'd kill another sheep, he said. He'd shoot a couple of ducks. We could have dinner later. But mum wouldn't cheer up. While they were talking, there was a knock on the back door. I went out. There in the porch was this little kid with a sugar sack in his arms. Honest, he could hardly hold it. His skinny brown legs were bowed with the weight. I waited for him to say something. He didn't. We just looked at each other. Then he pushed the sack at me. For your mum and dad, he said. I tell you, I nearly dropped it. There was something inside, heavy, kind of floppy. The kid walked backwards across the veranda, then turned and ran over the paddocks. I put the sack down and opened it. Yes, it was the fish, a huge thing, blue and silver, still wet and smelling of the sea. Well, you should have seen my mother. Dad, too. They couldn't believe it. Dad thought the boy was somebody staying with Pete and Roymata, and he phoned to thank them. Uncle Pete said he didn't know anything about it. Come off it, man, he said. You think if I got a fish like that, I'd give it away? So we never found out who the kid was or where the big fish came from. Like I said, it was fresh caught, and the sea was more than 30 miles away. All I know is we had a 14-pound snapper with peas and new potatoes from the garden, and it was the best Christmas dinner I ever tasted. I would now like to invite Sally Mabel to come forward to read a small carol by New Zealand poet and hymn composer Shirley Murray. <clears throat> Child of Christmas story, stable, straw, and star, 
small and sweet and gentle, tell us who you are. Child whose baby finger round our own is curled, come to melt our hearts and come to change the world. Child of Jew and Gentile, child of white and black, teach us how to love you, teach us what we lack. Child of Mary's courage, birthed in human pain, tell us what your name is, be our hope again. I would now like to invite uh, our special music by a brother-sister act here. <laughs> and I would like to uh, give thanks for Rachel and her brother Bennett for preparing this music for tonight. The King James Bible translates the Persian word magi as wise men. But in truth, the magi of the Persian court were both men and women. So it might have been in truth three wise women who followed the star. I now invite Kate Todd to read Norma Farber's The Queens Came Late. That's right, if they were three kings, maybe they were three queens. The queens came late, but the queens were there, with gifts in their hands and crowns in their hair. They'd come, these three, like the kings from far, following, yes, the guiding star. They'd left their ladles linens, looms, their children playing in nursery rooms, and told their sitters, take charge, for this 
is a marvellous sight that we must not miss. The queens came late, but not too late, to see the animals, small and great, feathered and furred, domestic and wild, gathered to gaze at a mother and child. And rather than frankincense and myrrh and gold for the babe, they brought for her, who held him, a homespun gown of blue and chicken soup with noodles too and a lingering, lasting cradle song. The queens came late and stayed not long for their thoughts already were straining far past manger and mother and guiding star and a child aglow as a morning sun towards home and children and chores undone. Christmas is a time we're called to be especially generous to those in need. Here at Auckland Unitarians, we call it the sacrament of generosity. This year, our koha will be shared with two agencies that support refugees and asylum seekers. Specifically, UNICEF's work with the Rohingya children who have been forced from their homes in Myanmar and the Asylum Seekers Support Trust in New Zealand. Our management committee has pledged to match your generosity dollar for dollar. Make it hurt. <laughs> Please be generous as you can. We all have certain things at this time of year that if we don't hear them or watch them, uh, it's not quite Christmas. For me, I think I've watched It's a Wonderful Life 60 times. <laughs> uh, but there's one other thing that I have to hear or read on Christmas, and it's by Robert Fulgham a Unitarian minister and author most of you may know because he wrote everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Less well known is his account of a church Christmas pageant. It both tickles and touches me and it would not be Christmas without hearing it again. Our church had not had a full-blown Christmas pageant in years. For one thing, we had become fairly rational about the season, content to let the Sunday school observe the event on their own turf in a low-key way. Then too, there was the last time we had gone all out. That week of the Christmas pageant coincided with an outbreak of the German measles, chicken pox, and the Hong Kong flu. The night of the pageant, there was a cyclone, a partial power failure that threw some people's clocks off, and one of the sheep hired for the occasion got diarrhea. <laughs> that was about par for the course, since Joseph and the two wise men threw up during the performance, and some little angels managed to both cry and wet their pants. To top it off, the choir of teenagers walking about in an irresponsible manner with lighted candles created more of a feeling of the fear of hell fire and the wrath of God than a feeling of peace on earth. I don't think it was really all that bad, and maybe all those things didn't happen the same year, but a sufficient number of senior ladies in the church had had it up to here with the whole hoo-ha, and tended to squelch any suggestion of another pageant. It was as if cholera had once again been among us, and nobody wanted to go through that again. But nostalgia is strong, and it's addled the brains of those same senior ladies as they considered the pleas of the younger mothers 
who had not been through this ritual ordeal and would not be dissuaded. It was time their children had their chance. And in short order, people who kept saying, I ought to know better, were right in there making angel costumes out of old bed sheets, cardboard, and chicken feathers. Just the right kind of bathrobes could not be found for the wise men, so some of the daddies went out and bought new ones and backed up a pickup truck over them to age them a bit. <laughs> One of the young mothers was pregnant, and it was made clear to her in loving terms that she was expected to come up with a real newborn baby child by early December. <laughs> she vowed to try. An angel choir was lashed into singing shape. A real major with real straw was obtained. And while there was a consensus on leaving out live sheep this time, some enterprising soul managed to borrow two small goats for the evening. The real coup was renting a live donkey for the mother Mary to ride in on. None of us had ever seen a live donkey ridden through a church chancel, and it seemed like such a fine thing to do at the time. <laughs> we made one concession to sanity, deciding to have the thing on a Sunday morning in the full light of day so we could see what we were doing, and nobody in the angel choir would get scared of the dark and cry or wet their pants. No candles, either and no full rehearsal. These things are supposed to be a little hokey anyhow, and nobody was going to go through the whole thing twice. Well, the great day came, and everybody arrived at church. Husbands who were not known for regular attendance came, probably for the same reason they would be attracted to a train wreck. <laughs> it, it wasn't all that bad, at least not early on. The goats did get loose in the parking lot and put on quite a rodeo with the shepherds. But we hooted out the carols with full voice and the angel choir got through its first big number, almost on key and in unison. The star of Bethlehem was lit over the manger and it came time for the entrance of Joseph and Mary, with Mary riding on the U-Haul donkey. Carry what later proved to be a raggedy Andy doll since the pregnant lady was overdue. It was the donkey that proved our undoing. The donkey made two hesitant steps through the door of the chancel, took a look at the whole scene, and seized up, locked his legs, put his whole body in a cement condition well beyond rigor mortis, and the procession grounded to a halt. Now, there are things you might consider doing to a donkey in private to get it to move. <laughs> but there is a limit of what you, you can do to a donkey in church on a Sunday morning in front of women and children. <laughs> Jerking on his halter and some wicked kicking on the part of the Virgin Mary had no effect. The president of the Board of Trustees, seated in the front row and dressed in his Sunday best, rose to the rescue. The floor of the chancel was polished wood. And so with another man pulling at the halter, and the president of the board crouched at the stern end of the donkey and pushed, slowly sliding the rigid beast <laughs> across the floor, inch by stately inch. With progress being made, the choir director turned on the sound system, which blared forth a mighty chorus from the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, accompanied by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Just as the donkey and his mobilizers reached mid-church, the CD player blew a fuse, and there was sudden silence. And in that silence, an exasperated voice came from the backside of the donkey. Move your ass, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that in church. <laughs> Followed immediately by a voice from the rear of the church, the donkey pusher's wife, Leon, shut your filthy mouth. And that's when the donkey brayed. 
If we'd held an election for jackass that day, there would have been several candidates mentioned, and the vote would have been pretty evenly distributed. We are such fun to watch when we do what we do. And though it has been several years since the church held another Christmas pageant, we have not seen the last one. The memory of the laughter outlives the memory of the hassles. And hope, hope always makes us believe that this time, this year, we'll get it right. That's the whole deal with Christmas. I guess it's just real life. Only a lot more of it all at once than usual. And I suppose we will continue doing it all get frenzied and confused and frustrated and even mad, and also get excited and hopeful and quietly pleased. We will laugh and cry and pout and ponder, get a little drunk and excessive, hug and kiss and make a great mess, spend too much and somebody will always be there to throw up or wet their pants. As always, we will sing only some verses and most of those off key. We will do it again and again and again. We are the Christmas pageant, the whole damn thing. And I think it's best to just let it happen. As at least one person I know can attest, getting pushy about it is trouble. Now we have the challenging task of living out a tradition we've done every year. We're going to try and create a circle around the church. Uh, and bring your candle, bring your order of service. Okay, what's supposed to happen now is we will uh, have a meditation uh, as we light the candles. Gerard, who has been our organist for many years and comes back every Christmas to play one song on the organ. It's the only time during the year the organ gets played for that one song. So thank you for coming. And he will play softly while we're lighting the candles. And once all the candles are lit, we will sing Silent Night. go two ways. As we light the first candle, let us be still in the darkness of our sacred space and listen to the quiet around us. For even in the quiet, there is the gentle being with others. Let us feel the warmth of our community, knowing we are but a quiet shadow, a quiet shadow in the glow of life within. Let us, know, let us be in the darkness the gift each candle offers, a diminutive light, yet the wondrous gift to kindle another's glow. Let us be in awe at, at this moment as we each take up our light and our candle, as it is a symbol of peace and goodwill that it will fill this night. So may we it be. We close this celebration with a carol written on Christmas Eve, 1818, in the Australian Alps by a young priest. After he trudged through the snow that night to bless the newborn infant of a peasant family. It seemed to him that that birth, like every birth, is a moment of holy grace. He was touched by the mysterious and wonder of new life. That life, 
every life is sacred and worthy of protection, respect, and love. Let us sing Silent Night, Holy Night. And now, keeping your candles lit, stay where we are. I invite David Roy to say our closing word. The work of Christmas begins by Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all peoples, to make a little music with the heart, and to radiate the light of Christ. Every day, in every way, in all that we do and in all that we say, then the work of Christmas begins.